And welcome back to yet another edition of Community Matters. I'm Jim Cameron, your host and the program director here at Darien TV 79. And uh, this is a show you as faithful viewers would know uh, all about the, the may, many uh, organizations in Darien, nonprofits, non-government organizations that are helping make the quality of life as excellent as it is in our town. We have two guests today, both of them from the Darien Nature Center. Alex uh, D'Amico is the executive director and Emily Safone is the program director. And I welcome both of you to the program. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. So um, let's talk a little bit about how the Nature Center got started. I understand that it really traces its roots back to 1979. Is that true? That's right. Yeah. Um, so it, it does. It goes all the way back to 1979. Um, there were, um, so I, I learned about this. I'm actually relatively new. I've only been in the, in, the, in the job for about seven months now. So it's been a real wonderful learning process, getting, getting a sense of the history of, of, of uh, how the Nature Center came to be over its 42 years. Um, but it goes all the way back to, um, to 1979 when um, some of the concerned citizens in Darien uh, had noticed other nature centers that had come about um, in neighboring towns where they had been thriving and um, they wanted uh, to put something together for Darien. You know, they thought it was a, a good cause and a wonderful um, approach to take. And, um, but the difference was that, uh, the kicker was that a lot of those uh, centers nearby, they had been gifted land, um, you know, so they had kind of a head start in a sense. Um, and Darien had not received uh, that, that kind of a gift. Um, so these concerned citizens, they, they got together, uh, some of our, our founding fathers, if you will, and, and mothers, um, and uh, they put together a, uh, a, a summer program that operated out of the local schools in Darien. And, um, you know, they had, I think they had a, a van that, that was gifted to them by somebody. And they just sort of hopped in the van, they went from school to school. And they, uh, they brought animals to the school and they sort of uh, um, had this, this uh, sort of makeshift program that they were taking around. Um, and then soon after that, um, the Nature Center uh, found uh, its first home, which, in which it was permitted to establish sort of a base of operations in, uh, here in Cherry Lawn Park, where we are now, but it was not in the building that we're in now, it was uh, in an old uh, defunct building uh, that used to be the Cherry Lawn School, uh, and they'd, they'd gone bankrupt uh, a few years earlier, and so they were the town allowed the Nature Center to use uh, some uh, well, one of the buildings of that school and one of the wings in that building of that school, and so they sort of had this little little base of operations. And then over time, sort of fast forwarding a bit, over time the um, the Nature Center programs began to expand. They were traveling to natural areas around town. Their programs really started to ramp up. You know, people were really responding uh, to uh, to what was what was going on in Darien. There was a real desire and a passion and a need uh, for the kind of programs that the Nature Center was offering. Um, they were, uh, you know, they were traveling around, educating children on the wonders and the benefits of nature. It was just a, a beautiful thing. Um, with all of that came increased needs. Uh, all of that, that, that increased programming caused a lot of needs, you know, meant, which meant they began to occupy more areas of the building. There was membership, there was fundraising, there was all that good stuff that's associated with nonprofit. There was an animal room, there was a library. Um, and this is all in the old building still. All right? in the old building. Yeah. They sort of, I think it was like uh, the first room, correct me here, Emily, I think the first room that they were granted access to was the old school cafeteria. And, um, you know, and I think it was only like five years prior that um, the school had shut down. And from what I'm told, uh, you know, the day that the school shut down, people just sort of put their stuff down and walked out. So when when the you know, when the Nature Center folks uh, showed up, you know, there was school uh, supplies and things on tables and stuff. It was just like it had been just, you know, they just walked out and closed the doors. So they had to do a little cleanup. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, they started to occupy more space. And, um, and then they got to the point, fast forwarding a bit, where there was really a, a real need. I mean, this was a really, you know, there was a, a real movement happening, you know, with this passion. And there was a real need for, for, um, for 
you know, actually constructed space that that was for a nature center. Um, so in the, um, I think it was in the late eighties, um, there was a, a woman named uh, a neighboring resident by the name of Virginia McGregor, who actually, you know, gave the nature center what it coveted, which was attractive land. She, uh, she donated, uh, some of her land, um, to be used by the nature center and the nature center then, um, in order to raise cash, sold that land to the Darien land trust. And the land trust essentially said, you're free to use that land so long as you know we were giving giving you the opportunity to use that land so long as you use it for educational purposes which is what we do um so then fast forwarding again to um uh you know what to put on that land and um so uh a capital campaign was put together in the in the 90s to actually construct a building uh and um so they, they raised money to construct a building of our own. And then in early 2002, um, the building that we are now occupied, that Emily and I are now sitting in uh, was constructed and, and there was a big opening. And um, we now have a space of our own. It's a fabulous space with a, a loft and it's, it's basically constructed like an old barn. If you look at our website, you can see a picture of it. It's, uh, um, I mean, if you can see behind Emily, there's our sort of our library space. Um, it's all kind of with uh, rafters and lofts and everything. And there are four classrooms downstairs. There's space for separate space for an animal room. There's a theater room. Um, it's just fabulous. Uh, when I got here, I mean, I mean, seven months ago, when I got here and, and walked in, I was just blown away. I thought this is just a beautiful, beautiful, inviting space. Um, so Emily, let's get, let's get Emily here because she's been sitting there listening to all yeah. this history of of a, a period of time when she was just a twinkle in her mother's eye. I'm sure that, uh, uh, you're, how, how long have you been here in uh, Darien, Emily? So I, um, I've most recently been at the nature center since 2013 in my current role as program director, but actually I started at the nature center in the year 2000 as the naturalist when we were still in the old building. Um, so when I was hired, the capital campaign was well underway. The, the architects were working on the plans for the new building. Um, so I was lucky enough to be able to see what we were working with over there um, across the park in the old uh, Cherry Lawn School building. And then like, like Al said, to then be introduced to this amazing building and resource in 2002, and then to be able to, to grow from there. It's been, it's been awesome. So let's talk a little bit about the programs you offer. I mean, you are the program director Sure. Uh, what kind of classes do you offer? Who do you serve? Um, how does so, it change during the course of the year? Okay, so um, probably what most people know us best for is serving the toddler, preschool, and early elementary school children of town. We offer, I mean, we do offer a lot of different programs, but on site here, we offer an on-site enrichment program for toddlers and preschoolers. So they come to us one or two days a week. They often go to another more traditional preschool in town. We offer after school programs where kids can come and take care of the animals, feeding and cleaning. Um, that's for elementary school kids. This is all run during the school year. We, we run after school programs where they're outside exploring Cherry Lawn Park. We do camps during spring break, during the winter break, um, things like that. And then, of course, we run our summer program again for the preschool to elementary school age children. Um, and then pocketed in there throughout the year, not on a real schedule necessarily, is we do programs with middle schoolers. We do programs for adults. We do programs for um, developmentally disabled adults uh, through the STAR program. We see seniors who come in for visits or we bring our animals to them. And then throughout the years, obviously it's been a little different these past couple of years due to COVID, but we also do some adult programming. We um, collaborate on programs with other organizations. Like we have two programs that Al can speak to coming up with the library, a talk at the library that we co-sponsor. We do some book clubs with them. So kind of a little bit of everything for everybody. And then of course we're open to the public now. So if you just wanna come any day but Sunday and come walk through the building, visit the animals, see what's going on. Yeah. Do you have a sense or any of the metrics about how many people uh, come in or use any one of the programs? How many lives do you touch in Darien? Oh my gosh, boy. Um, I know, I don't know that answer. Um, 
there a couple of years ago we did have to figure that out for something but i'll be honest that that number doesn't sit in my head um i just... believe it was something it was something like in terms of i don't know about the programming um emily uh you can probably provide a better number of like you know the, the kids that pass through on an annual basis but as far as the actual visitors i think it was something like between pre-covid i believe it was something like between 18 it was around eighteen thousand um visitors uh per year mm. that sort of came in um but uh yeah i think that was just sort of general visitation um as far as the actual programming um yeah I will say that I would describe our programs as robust. We we generally at this point are filling all of the programs that we have. Like we're sort of at capacity with things, but I don't have I don't have hard numbers on that. Talk about the uh, the uh, the animals that you have at at the center. How many do you have? What kind are they? Which are the most popular? <laughs> Depends who you're talking to as far as popularity. Um, uh, so we have probably somewhere around 20 different species of animals, um, but then we have multiples of some of those. Uh, Al, what's your favorite animal here at the Nature Center? <laughs> the owls, without a question. I'm a bird guy, so I love the owls. And the owls are just, so we have two uh, eastern screech owls named Blinken and Luna. And um, they're, they're, when you walk in the animal room, they're, they're kind of the, they're sort of the first cage there. And they, you know, because they're owls, they sort of like immediately like are scoping you out and follow you across the room. Um, but they're so adorable. I don't think you know about screech owls, but screech owls are, are very small owls and they're adorable. Um, I love them. They're great. And where do you, daughter, where do you find screech owls? I mean, if you're a nature center and you say, hey, you know, you got a checklist, Santa, I don't want to get two screech owls. Like, oh, where gosh. do you get screech owls? You mean uh, like as a like a, to 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 take care of like as pets? Yeah, I mean to bring them in to bring them into the nature center. So um, you're I, not out there trapping them in nature, are you? <laughs> no, the, I believe so. That's a good question for uh, for our animal uh, curator Molly, who's just a, a rock star. She just is just such an animal lover, and she takes really wonderful care of the of the animals. Um, but she she finds um, you know sometimes they're rescues. Most of the time they're rescues. I, I believe sometimes they come from like. Uh, from animal um, like zoos and, and aquariums and so forth, like places that that have that take care of animals for educational purposes, and then they may have, you know, extras like uh, babies or something like that, and they'll and they'll um, they'll give them away. Um, but a lot of times, the rescues, like for example, Blinken and Luna, the owls, they're um, uh, I think they're one of them is uh, has a broken wing, I believe, uh, mm-hmm. and the other one is kind of uh, has sight problems, so. You know, they, they were sort of rescues and um, yeah. all, all of the out, the owls always come as a rescue. That, that, so we, and sometimes Al's right. We do reach out to, to zoos and other nature centers to see if they have or know of, um, because a lot of times some of the rehabilitators, right. So a, a place will like wildlife in crisis will take in a, a, a raptor could be the screech owl could be something else they've rehabilitated it it cannot be re-released into the wild and now they need a place a home for it to be and so there's just sort of a network of of people who are in this field who are always looking to find places to be able to to home these these birds emily what's what's the what's your favorite animal i i've never asked you that what's yours um really if i had to choose a favorite it is the ferrets um, I don't know if you, Jim, if you're familiar with a ferret is, it looks like a, a weasel, um, but they're just so fun and funny and curious. And, and I would have them as pets, except they are part of the um, mustelid family. So they have a, a definite odor, which I don't want uh, in my home. And so, but those are my favorites. Yeah. Is it, is it, are the kids allowed to play with the ferrets or touch them? I mean, yes. they, they do have teeth, I know, ferrets, right? No, they do, but these are, you know, they're pets. These are, these are pets. And, and mo- all of the animals that we have, I should say almost all the animals we have, kids can be hands-on with. They can at least have a chance to touch them. There's a, there's a few that are off limits. Um, and then I would even then go even further and say the majority of our animals are handleable by children. We don't necessarily let them all handle them because that's not the best thing for the animal itself. But we're very careful when we take animals in um, that it's an animal that can be used for education purposes. Yeah. And the turtles, are, I think, are popular too. We are rescue ourselves. I'm sorry, go ahead. I say the turtles are popular, the reptiles. Tur- oh, yeah. The reptiles, the snake is very popular. Mm-hmm. Um 
of course, you know, with the preschool set, the, the rabbits are very, very popular um, and are, do, and are big. Do kids have, uh, you know, non-traditional pets at home aside from cats and dogs? Do people ever come in and go, I have a ferret, I have a, a pot belly pig or something like that? Oh. Yes. Pig, I won't say I've heard anytime recently, but um, yes. And we also get a lot of parents who come in and ask, you know, my child really wants a turtle. What do you recommend? And then we, it's a great time for us to do some education because uh, we then recommend that you don't get a turtle. Like a turtle is a perfect example of an animal that you really shouldn't have as a pet. Um, unless you're a real, you know, enthusiast for reptiles, they're, they're difficult to take care of. Okay. I'll bite. Why can't, why can't I have a turtle or why okay, shouldn't well, I have a turtle? First sourcing turtles is hard. So you shouldn't, you, you should not be, it's against the law to take turtles out of the wild. Um, but turtles as reptiles, they require special lighting to be able to take care of their skin and shell. They do re require, you know, clean water if you have a if you have a pond turtle they require special diets and it's usually just more than what the typical pet owner is looking for they're just not usually looking for that kind of commitment and then turtles are very long lived so they're mm -hmm. kind of like birds in that way this is not a you know a, a hamster 2 to 3 year deal we are talking decades sometimes more with the tortoises like easily 80 90 years of having to plan for for that animal's life. And that's a serious commitment. I mean, that's that is a serious you're commitment. taking on a responsibility when you bring, bring an right. animal like that in. Yeah. I mean, on the flip side, uh, around Easter time, there's always stories about baby chicks and bunny rabbits. I mean, do you, do parents bring those when they're no longer soft and fuzzy and attractive to you and say, how, what do I, what can I do with this animal? Yes. Yeah. Um, and we try to, uh, we really try to nip it in the bud, right? We try to catch them on the other end, which is, hey, you know what? The Nature Center is an amazing resource for your kids to learn about and spend time with these animals. So maybe instead of getting your own turtle or your own rabbit or your own snake or whatever it might be, sign up for an animal caretakers class. If you're a high school student, come talk to Molly, our animal director. She can hook you up with some volunteering time in the animal room, right? Like there's ways to experience animals without having them in your timeshare it's like a timeshare turtle yes yeah it's exactly why i don't have ferrets because i have them here i don't need to have them at home <laughs> that's right yeah we also have a we also have an animal sponsorship program so even if if you're not able to to you know to get into one of our classes you can you can sponsor an animal and essentially you can you know you can come visit the animal anytime you want it sort of entitles you to to get some private time with the animals but you can essentially pay for us to take care of the animals for you you know and, and that guarantees that I can come down when the center is open and, and I was going to say play with my animal, but yeah. at least see it have, as you say, some private time with it. Sure. Yeah. Right. Uh, the, our animal sponsorship program, uh, you know, we have sort of different levels and, you know, you, you purchase a sponsorship and it gives you um, a month, two months, three months, six months uh, of, um, of exclusive use sort of sort of not necessarily exclusive rights but it gives you the opportunity within that time frame to um to to get in touch with us and schedule um anytime you like some private time uh with what, what are the what's the pricing on that uh it starts at 75 dollars and goes all the way up to 900 wow yeah uh well that brings me to my next question alex as you know executive director how do you support all of this? How do you make sure Emily's got uh, ferret food to feed the ferrets and the turtles are cleansed and sweetened and taken care of? How do you support yourself? That's a great question. So um, we, are a, we, we are, of course, a, a nonprofit. We're a 501c3, um, but we're a little different in that we, we, uh, we offer a, a wonderful service uh, um, you know, in terms of uh, all of the programming that uh, that Emily outlined, um, uh, parents um, and the kids that come and and, and join our programs, parents uh, pay for the service. Uh, they come and they they sign up for these classes, um, and so that brings us uh, you know a portion of our revenue. But uh, it doesn't bring us all of our revenue. You know we still need to um, to fundraise. So uh, we send out you know we have we have events we have um, we have campaigns that like the animal sponsorship campaign, for example, 
um, that raise money uh, on behalf of, uh, of the Nature Center. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we're, we're constantly, um, you know, in search of, of making sure that we have enough money to, to you know, to feed the pets and, and keep the lights on and pay all the bills and, and all of that wonderful stuff and keep the mission going, essentially. And how did you fare in the last couple of years of COVID when everybody was shut down and uh, sheltering in place? And I guess someone had to come in and take care of the animals, but uh, you weren't hosting kids or camps either, right? Uh, well, I think Emily, uh, you can probably you were there for all of that. You know, what was it? What was it like? Um, you know, going through COVID. Yeah. So um, actually, we you know we shut down with everybody else mid March. We're actually at the anniversary, I think, right this week. Um, and so we our our classes, lots of classes got canceled, and then our our preschool classes that happen here on site, we we transferred into an online type version where we provided parents with the curriculum, the activities and some supplementary videos and with animal encounters and storybooks and stuff. So they could sort of have their experience at home through that spring. But we actually opened back up June of 2020 for our summer camp. We, mm -hmm. um, it was a go ahead with the state, you know, we're licensed to the office of early childhood and summer camps could run under some very, you know, strict restrictions, but we were able to sort of modify what we did and we're just really in a very good position uh, in that sense because most of our programming is outside. So being outside was just, that's what everybody wanted. Nobody wanted to be inside, no problem. Our summer camp is always outside. So we just had to you know, adjust smaller groups. Groups can't mix with each other, that sort of thing, health checks. Um, but since June of 2020, we've been running all of our programs. And do, and do you get a lot of help from the parents as well too? Or well, we they just kind of, they drop them off and say, you take care of them. <laughs> well, we, I think our parents are incredible. They're so supportive of what we do. And so it was a shift for them. I mean, summer is easy, right? Because everybody spends their summer outside, but then fall rolled around and we said, okay, we're going to run our programs, but guess what? We're, we've got these outdoor classrooms now, not indoor classrooms. And mm -hmm. so we need your help in helping us keep this going. And so everybody was learning about layering and the right kind of footwear and hats and hand warmers and all of those things to get us through those, those cold winter months. And so they've been fantastic. And your programs are not only open to Darien residents. Is that true? Absolutely. So if kids from New Canaan, I mean, how far away do you draw from? What kind of towns? Um, Greenwich. We've got a couple of families from Greenwich right now. We've had a couple of families from Wilton. And then I'd say, so then inside that circle, nothing beyond that. Wonderful. Uh, so uh, this will be a, a jump ball. Either one of you can go for this question. If, uh, if you had another million dollars in your budget, if somebody seeing this program sat down and wrote you a check for a million dollars, what would you like to do to uh, expand or develop uh, the Nature Center? Oh, gosh, uh, I think that's a good question that I, maybe both of us can answer. Um, uh, um, I would say uh, maybe maybe Emily would, would, would give the same answer, but I would say um, f come up with ways. Uh, you know, there's, there's, we're very fortunate. We're very fortunate that, that the Nature Center is, um, is, uh, is popular. I mean, we, we have a lot of folks who are very interested in our programming. We're, um, I mean, it's a testament to to Emily's great work over a long period of time, over these many years, um, it's 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 been a long time coming to really establish this sort of uh, kind of network, if you will, in in the town of Darien and beyond. Um, but uh, we have so many people that want to take part in our programming. So I would say, you know, if we had that carte blanche, I would say that we would come up with ways to um, to expand uh, our programming, um, you know, and basically try to reach more people. Uh, you know, it's a bit of a broad answer, but I would just try to find ways to bring as many people, uh, uh, to accomplish our mission as possible. I mean, that's what we are. We're mission oriented. So we, we want to, uh, you know, we want as many people to, to experience, um, uh, what we're looking to accomplish, uh, as we can. Emily, what's your, on your wish list? Okay, I really like that answer. So I'm, I'm a yes to that. But what actually came to mind right away for me is, um, so we're at 20 years now in this building. And um, the when we opened it, what we were able to give our animals was was 
top notch at the time, but our exhibits and their enclosures have aged over the over the years. And it's time for us to to give them now what would be considered top notch for for animal care. So they're up their enclosures need an upgrade. And not just for the animals themselves, but for our visitor experience, right? So much has happened in the world of of exhibits and exhibit design. And would really we really should be looking at uh, an overall a new a new animal room a new way to experience the animals here at the nature center hmm. yeah and um, we start which i wanted to mention uh the darianne foundation uh gave us a generous grant two years ago and we started that with our turtle exhibit and we have this new new england habitat turtle exhibit thanks to their funding that houses all of our turtles the darianne foundation has been uh extraordinarily generous in a number of places around through town and for full disclosure, obviously, they have given money to TV79 as well, too. So, uh, yeah, they, they sprinkle their magic dust pretty far and wide around town. So we're very lucky to have them. Let me ask a, a slightly, I don't want to put you on the spot, but a slightly tougher question. Um, what about the social justice component in your education efforts? I mean, you are in a very rich, white, affluent town. And... To get to the nature center, uh, there's no bus that runs by your operation. You got to have a car. You're proud of that, you know, parental SUV parade that you see in front of the schools every day, et cetera. Um, have you done any outreach to uh, the economically disadvantaged in Norwalk and Stanford to help bring your message of nature to them as well, too? Um, I would say that's a really good question. Um, I would say that it's something that uh, um, we we haven't uh, done enough of uh, since. I mean, I've, like I said, I've, I've been here for uh, seven months now and um, it was something I noticed as well. And, and it's something that I think uh, we could really uh, we could really use, uh, you know, more attention on. I mean, we could put more attention on. Um, you're right. We we don't we don't really have that kind of sort of like public access uh, in that same way. It, it's a little bit different um, in terms of where we're located and the, and the sort of constituency that we have. Um, but there, there's been discussions about, you know, um, sort of opportunity, ways we can sort of open up opportunities um, for perhaps the, uh, the less economically advantaged, if, if you will, um, and, uh, and sort of expand our mission to, um, uh, to be more sort of culturally round, if you will. Um, so, uh, I think we have a lot of work to do there. Uh, um, uh, that's, that's what I'll just come out and say. We, we have, we have an, a lot of work to, to, to move forward in that realm. I think one of the very small things that we are able to offer is that we are a nature center that is free and open to the public. And so there is no, there is no admissions charge to come. So you can, obviously the park is open to the public, but you can come and you can enjoy the animals. And sometimes we have impromptu, you know, people come and are walking around some of our our staff sharing animals and, and things like that. And so in that little way, I just, I've, I've always appreciated that we've been accessible, not necessarily with transportation wise, because you're right, the closest bus would be the post road. Um, but at least once people are here, they are welcome to come in no matter where they're coming from. There's no admission charge. There's admission no charge. residency requirement. No, some... no membership. Yep. Necessary, don't, not needed to be a member, nothing like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, in your early days back in 1979, part of the organization was done by some advocacy groups like the Audubon Society, the Conservation Commission. I didn't know we had a Conservation Commission, um, the DCA, the Community Association, uh, the public schools, et cetera. Do you ever get involved in going beyond just the educational aspects of preserving the nature of nature into more advocacy for um, don't put chemicals on your lawn or you don't need plastic bags. Um, have you crossed over that line? Uh, and if so, was it successful or did it alienate some donors? So we, we have, we have essentially sort of break our mission down into what we sort of like to look at as three micro missions, if you will. We've got nature education, firsthand experiences in nature, and then environmental action and stewardship. And that environmental action and stewardship is really um, the, it's, it's something that we, that we take a lot of pride in. And it's also the most kind of like the most open-ended. It's very, very broad. I mean, the, the, the possibilities are endless. You know, it can, it can almost feel overwhelming 
you know, when you're trying to think about, you know, all the things that that you or I or any of us can do uh, to either promote more green living or, you know, engage in sustainable habits, uh, environmental protection, you know, uh, it, it, it runs the gamut. Um, and so we, we've, uh, we've put lately and over the past couple of years, you know, we put a strategic plan together. Um, it was right pre COVID. We sort of got our strategic plan going um, and it got a little bit delayed, you know, because of COVID, but we're back up and running. Um, and one of those major aspects of the, of the strategic plan is to put a stronger focus on um, environmental action and stewardship and that the outreach associated with environmental action and stewardship so that we're, um, not just offering programming to kids, and, which is wonderful, which is amazing because we're really getting them started early, but uh, focusing perhaps on um, uh, education from a, from a broader sense and especially perhaps for adults as well, keeping uh, um, a focus on educating adults. Like you said, you know, not putting pesticides on your lawn. Um, you know, uh, we, we're associated with, uh, um, with something called the Pollinator Pathway Initiative which is a wonderful mm -hmm. organization in town. Um, so we, we're trying to come up with ways to kind of get that outreach going that goes beyond just sort of the, um, the, uh, the youth nature education aspect of things. I'll let Emily, if she wants to add as well, I think she has a, a, a lot of great things to say as well. Yeah, Emily, you've been around for a little bit longer than Al. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that outreach mission? Sure, I, I think really... You know, Al mentioned the three pillars and, and one of them being uh, environmental action and stewardship. That was a refreshed mission that only came out of that 2019 strategic planning session. And so prior to that, uh, the mission of the Nature Center didn't exp explicitly state any sort of action or advocacy. So it never, it was never at the forefront. It, it just sort of, there were individuals working individually um, on projects in town, but the Nature Center never really took a stance on anything because they didn't, they didn't see it in their mission. But, but the board of directors and every, all the stakeholders uh, leading up to that strategic plan realized the importance of organizations like ourselves to make those stances. And so they wrote it into the mission. And so we are just sort of now finding our feet and how are we gonna to go forward and do that? And Pollinator Pathway is a perfect example with them sort of umbrellaed under us. We're able to work with them and, and taking advantage of their expertise. If you're familiar with uh, Juliet Kane and Deepika Saxena, right? They have so much knowledge about this topic and they're helping us then to bring that that message forward well here's your chance to educate people talk to us about what i mean we've heard about this pollinator pathway thing what is it how do i get involved why should i care and you want to talk about it or shall i uh, it doesn't either way i yeah uh, i mean i can i can offer my so um so uh deepika and juliet are just they're 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 warriors. I mean, they're, they're fantastic. Uh, they're amazing. Um, what they put together is um, an initiative. So it, I, I believe it started actually outside of Darien. It's sort of a, a, a Connecticut wide uh, initiative. Um, and it's an opportunity for folks who, so there's, you know, I don't know, everywhere, pretty much all over the country, world, whatever. People are, you know, in, in urban areas and, or suburban areas. Um, there's a, there's a, a tendency to sort of be lawn focused, you know, um, and uh, that, you know, it's pretty to some, uh, but uh, that lawn focus is not necessarily um, a, a habitat or an ecosystem e even that lends itself to um, uh, biodiversity and, uh, and allowing, you know, species like uh, pollinators uh, to, to thrive. And so what they promote is um, uh, they offer services that uh, where they'll come to your house and, uh, and they'll offer advice um, on how to uh, transition your yard, your lawn, whatever you've got into something that is more inviting to uh, pollinator species that are, you know, that pass through the area um, uh, or that live in the area. Um, and so uh, they, you know, they, I mean, essentially that means sort of uh, um, allowing a little bit, you know, sort of making a sort of a, it's more of a kind of a personal philosophy adjustment from lawn care and maintenance to uh, um, being okay with a little bit of a, of a wild feel, uh, you know, I mean, that's sort of, you know, where they, where, where those species thrive. So that's kind of what the initiative is all about. And what they've done is they've, 
they've uh, gathered homes all over Darien and and elsewhere um, to uh, commit to that, you know, to being a pollinator path, a, you know, a member of the pollinator pathway. So they've sort of like, they're sort of trying to fill in uh, these homes wherever they can, um, which is what they do. So we've got this kind of map of homes that have committed to the pollinator pathway. So you're allowing all of these species to thrive and increasing, even in the suburban area, increasing um, uh, biodiversity. Well put. And you've inspired me to uh, invite two more guests to Community Matters. Uh, Absolutely. Juliet and Deepika, well, I'm sure they would love to oh, yeah, they explain this program in They're greater wonderful. detail. Wonderful. But um, in uh, the moments we have left, I know uh, you are obviously looking for donors. Are you also looking for volunteers to help uh, at the Nature Center? Yeah, so we're we're always well, you know, we're, yeah, we're we're always looking for uh, for folks that are willing to help out in any way that that they that they can, um, and that they're willing. Um, folks who we are we're we're a nonprofit, and so we're always looking for ways to to um to increase our overhead so that we can put it back into the mission. That's what we're all about. So anytime anybody wants to to volunteer, offer their services, uh, in whatever form that takes, whether that be uh in terms of uh you know in kind or in services or certainly in money but but you know anything that they can offer their time um i actually uh um before i was here i was the uh um i ran the volunteer program at central park um central park conservancy hmm. so um you know and they had thousands of volunteers um so i actually have a volunteer administrative background um you know, the makeup is a little bit different here where it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a smaller operation, but it's nonetheless, uh, it's no more or less passion. And, and so, um, you know, anytime that anybody wants to offer, uh, uh, you know, their help, we're always going to take it, you know, in, in whatever way we can. So absolutely. fabulous. Yeah. And I just want to put a, a pitch out there then, you know, we have an event coming up on April 23rd. It's our Earth Day event. It's called Spring Into Nature. Um, and it's a time for individuals and families to come and learn about ways to sustainable living. And there's some, you know, animals and entertainment and we're scooping at the pond and, and learning about camping and all sorts of things. But that's a perfect example of an event where it takes more than just the staff to put that on. And so if someone wants to come and spend a couple of hours either helping us park people or or helping, you know, so raffle tickets or whatever, there's so many different opportunities there. That's a that's a perfect example. Our events are where we can we often are able to use volunteers. Yeah. Well, I am going to put <laughs> April 23rd, spring into nature, April 23rd. Yep. I got the plug. I'm going to put the uh, website address and uh, the phone number and the email and the credits right. to this program. Uh, I want to thank our, our two guests, Al uh, D'Amico, who is the executive director, and uh, Emily Safone, who's the program director of the Darien Nature Center. Thank you. Uh, both for all you do for the town and thank you for being on the program today. Thank you, Jen, for all that you do as well. Appreciate it. Yeah. My pleasure. Come visit us. Yeah. And thank you, our faithful viewers, for watching yet another edition of Community Matters. <laughs>